I want to thank Professor uh, Lynn Schmidt and Sherry for inviting me to come here and be among you. I've been to the Philippines quite a few times, uh, but this is my first time to be on your campus and to work with you as Nazarenes. I've uh, worked with Nazarenes from time to time, and I grew up as a free Methodist, so you could say that we're uh, cousins. I'm not sure we're kissing cousins, <laughs> but we certainly are. And I want to thank President Bruce Oldham for, uh, for his welcome and, and hospitality. It's just, uh, it's just great to be here. <clears throat> The address I've given today is the gospel and culture, advocates or adversaries in contextualization. Now this morning I want to address the issue of the relationship between God's eternal word and the changing world in which we understand it, both down through time and across our planet from one culture to another. How do we faithfully follow Jesus and remain within our culture? so that we don't become foreigners in our own land, so that we don't end up living in an artificial Christian bubble with few, if any, non-Christian friends and colleagues, and we become disconnected from the social and political life of our communities. I used to have Japanese students at Asbury Seminary tell me that they couldn't be both Japanese and Christian at the same time. If they were going to follow Jesus, they had to be more American than Japanese. Perhaps that kind of thinking is why less than 1% of Japanese are Christians today, after well over 100 years of Christian missionary presence. In China, before Mao Zedong came to power in 1949, there was a common phrase that went like this, one more Christian, one less Chinese. Or another way of saying it was gain a convert but lose a citizen. Unfortunately, this perception is not a relic of the past, but is alive and well all over the world, and especially here in Asia, where Christianity is often called a foreign religion, and missionaries perceived as imperialists and proselytizers. The perennial challenge that is also before us today is how does the gospel relate to culture? How does the one universal gospel connect to the massive diversity of people all around the earth speaking over 8,000 different languages and embedded in even more different cultures and social locations? I often think about this question and when I get discouraged because it seems we North Americans are spreading the ideals of the American dream around the world more than the values of the kingdom of God, I turn to the back of the book to see how it all turns out. And in Revelation 7, 9, I read John saying, After this, I looked, and there was an enormous crowd. No one could count all the people. They were from every race, tribe, and nation, and language, and they stood in front of the throne of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they were all praising God in English. <laughs> well, then maybe English is a second language. No, they were praising God in their own language. And if that's the image of how it all turns out, why shouldn't we be practicing that today? Of course not. The one true gospel had transformed them into becoming disciples of Jesus within their culture, not disconnected from it. So this morning and tomorrow morning, I want to talk about why contextualization is so crucial for the advancement of the kingdom of God, especially in Asia, but literally everywhere cross-cultural witnesses, who we often call missionaries, have gone carrying the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll discover the biblical roots and argument for contextualization, especially as it's portrayed in the Incarnation. We'll also discuss why there's so much opposition to contextualization, especially from church leaders, whether local or foreign. We'll address some of the fears people have and argue that radical biblical contextualization, that's the word I like to use, radical, it's absolutely radical, biblical contextualization, all three words have to, be, have to go together. It is not the slippery slope to syncretism, as many fear, but rather it's the very best hedge against it. In my three days with you, I want that theme to come through very, very clearly. Contextualization is not the slippery slope that leads to syncretism. We're afraid of that, but rather it is the very best hedge against it. 
perhaps we should look at a definition, and then I want to tell you a story. In one of my articles on contextualization, I've defined it as a method. Oh, let's see. I think that's up here, isn't it? There we go. Okay. I put it up here in case you want to look at it, but um, I'm going to read it here anyway. Um, <clears throat> I've defined it as a method and a process that attempts to communicate the gospel in word and deed. Very important. Not just proclamation, but the way we live out the gospel is even more important. And to establish the church in ways that make sense to people within their local cultural context. Presenting Christianity in such a way that it meets people's deepest needs and penetrates their worldview, thus enabling them to follow Christ and remain within their own culture. I'll be talking more about this uh, tomorrow, is how, how do we go from the surface to the deep levels of our culture uh, with, the, with the gospel. Now for a short story. In November 1981, as a Methodist missionary ministering with, with my family in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, I was conducting, conducting a week-long seminar on Melanesian society, culture, and religion with a large American mission in the region. I remember the scene very well. We had an old-fashioned chalkboard, and I wrote so much on the board with cheap chalk that by the end of the week, I could hardly talk. In fact, I used to joke, I'm probably going to die from white lung instead of black lung. <laughs> I, I had consumed so much chalk. <clears throat> well, the mission wanted to implement a pastoral plan known as Basic Christian Communities. That was the plan they wanted to introduce here in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. That idea, Basic Christian Communities, has, had originated in Brazil, then spread to Tanzania, and had now come to the highlands of Papua New Guinea, where they wanted to implement it. They called on me as an anthropologist to help them dig deeper into understanding Melanesian worldviews, religion, and culture. We had a great week together, and then we came to the final session. I said to the missionaries, there are two ways that we can now interpret and apply the pastoral plan of basic Christian communities among Melanesians here in the southern highlands of Papua New Guinea. First, we can think about basic Melanesian communities that can integrate the gospel into their culture and worldview, which in turn will enable them to express and live out biblical values in a Melanesian way. In other words, we won't have to deny, they won't have to deny their birth identity in order to affirm their second birth identity as followers of Jesus. I told them that I think this approach will enable growth in Christ-likeness from within their society. There will be transformation from within their worldview. Believers will not have to deny their birth identity as Melanesians in order to affirm their second birth identity as followers of Jesus. That was the first approach. I said, now there's a second way that we can interpret this phrase, basic Christian communities. This second approach would take the phrase, basic Christian communities, and introduce what you as American missionaries understand to be Christian forms of worship, theology, beliefs, values, and whether intentionally or unconsciously, impose those on the basic Melanesian communities. These two approaches, I said, are very different and will have very different outcomes. The first approach puts emphasis on the Melanesian community that interprets and receives the gospel in order to address their basic spiritual needs, such as issues of spiritual power, confronting evil spirits, honoring the ancestors, honoring the ancestors without fear of retaliation, and making sense of their world. It will work. And I predict that you will have an indigenous Melanesian church where the gospel is integrated and contextualized into their society and culture, responding to their needs and transforming their allegiance to Jesus. Their church may not look like your church back home in Pennsylvania, I warned, I warned them, but you're no longer back home. <laughs> you're here in Papua New Guinea. That reminds me of a comment that William Smalley uh, in an article on the indigenous church once wrote. <laughs> He said, one sign of indigenous church is the missionaries won't like it. <laughs>
So I told the gathering of missionaries and church workers that the second approach will probably not work. Because in the name of Christianity, you will be imposing a foreign church structure and a westernized theology that fails to address and meet the deepest worldview issues of these Melanesian Christians. I warned them that if, your appro that if you approach these communities with a pre-packaged plan and lay that heavy burden on the shoulders of these Melanesian communities, I feared that approach would fail because it would not be rooted in Melanesian soil. I would predict that within a generation or less, you would have only nominal Christians who are Christians in name only, but with very little personal and social transformation because the gospel had yet not penetrated and engaged the deepest parts of their worldview. It is only skated on the surface and altered some behavior, but not brought the deep transformation power of Jesus. Veteran missionary, Father Ben from Pittsburgh stood up at the back of the room and nearly shouted, Now, Whiteman, you've gone too far. By the way, that wasn't the first or the last time that I've been accused of going too far. Father Ben continued, We are here first as American Catholics with the Capuchin religious order on which, um, on religious, religious order, and there are certain distinctive features of our Catholic order on which we must insist. We cannot forfeit those in order to adapt to the Melanesian context. The room fell silent, and I didn't have to say a word. But the conclusion was obvious to everyone there. The choice of these two approaches was Melanesian Christians or Roman Catholics. Within the other mission organization who insisted on imposing their religious forms and theology on receptor people, I could just as easily have said Melanesian Christian or Free Methodist, Melanesian Christians or Nazarenes, Christian or Baptist. You get the picture. You see, what was missing here was a comprehensive understanding of contextualization and a healthy appreciation for how the gospel relates to culture and connects deeply with Melanesian worldviews. Also missing was a robust theology of creation that discerned where God was already present in their culture long before the missionaries arrived. As Wesleyans, we tend to have a strong theology of redemption, but a weaker theology of creation that recognizes the missio dei, or the mission of God, in the world. You see, this is not our mission. It is God's mission. And God invites ordinary people like you and me to join God in that mission. And if we can get that straight, our whole approach to mission would be quite different. You see, culture is not the enemy of the gospel. It's the vehicle through which we come to understand and live out the gospel. God makes himself known and understood in the language and culture of people and has been doing this from the very beginning of creation. So why do we so often think that culture is the enemy of the gospel when it's the avenue through which God speaks to all of us? And when God does not speak to us through our culture, we don't hear. And there's a part of us that goes untransformed. There are three things we can say about the gospel that re relates to culture. First thing is, the gospel affirms most of culture. This is important. The gospel affirms most of culture. I didn't have to learn another language. I didn't have to cease being an American to be a follower of Jesus. There's a lot of my culture that the gospel affirms. But that's only part of the story. The second one is the gospel critiques and confronts some of culture. I cannot be a true follower of Jesus and be 100% American. Part of the American values of individualism and materialism, those are antithetical to being a follower of Jesus. And I have to be out of step with my own culture at that point. And here's the really good news. The gospel affirms most. The gospel critiques and confronts some. But the good news is the gospel transforms all of culture. And this is what we want to see. This is what contextualization will bring. 
a, a complete transformation of the gospel so we can be within our culture and be true followers of Jesus. Now we know both from, anthrop from, from missiological anthropology and incarnational theology that the Christian fellowship groups that we plant, which we often call churches, in cultures that are different from our own must always be relevant to the society and culture and also faithful to scripture. So relevance and fidelity. Relevance and fidelity, these are both necessary. We are continually, and rightly so, warned of introducing forms of Western Christianity on what we have from colonial times to the present called the mission field. That's a term I wish we could leave behind because there's a sense of possession. It's our mission field. No, it's God's mission. It's not our mission field. So here we're caught in a theological tension and a denominational dilemma. On the one hand, as best we can, we want to preserve a pure faith, a pure Christian faith, and essential biblical values. On the other hand, we seek to encourage the new believers to express their faith and Christian values in ways which are culturally appropriate for them. So the basic problem seems to be how do we communicate and live out the gospel with new believers in other cultures without having the gospel contaminated by what we perceive as non-Christian forms and values with which it must be communicated, understood, and interpreted. In other words, how do we promote contextualization and avoid syncretism? That's, that's the crux. Now this syncretistic contamination may be expressed in any aspect of Christian ministry. Discipleship, proclamation, fellowship, service, or teaching, all of which in the final analysis are culturally conditioned. When we do discipleship, we do it in the cultural context. There's no such thing as culture-free Christianity. All churches are culture churches. The issue is whose culture will they reflect, the foreigners or the locals? That's the issue. Now, it's partly out of this fear of contamination which hindered early fourth century missionary efforts, in, uh, missionary efforts in Europe among the Goths, who are our German forebears. For example, Ulfius, the missionary bishop to the Goths, who lived from 311 to 388, had very little support for his Bible translation proposals because it, because it was thought at the time that the pure gospel could not be possibly translated into the pagan and impure language of the Goths. Imagine that. Here's the pure gospel, and it just simply can't go into this impure language of the Goths. Now we laugh <laughs> at such an absurdity. But 1,200 years later, Johannes Becanus, who lived from 1519 to 1572, a Dutch physician and linguistic scholar would argue that Adam and Eve, and by implication God, spoke a variant of German because it was the world's most perfect language. <laughs> you know, we all kind of think that, don't we? That God really does speak my language, which is true, but he speaks all other 8,000 as well. Now, this is one of the stark contrasts uh, between Christianity and Islam. Christianity demands to be translated into the vernacular language and culture of every people group. Islam resists it. If you want to be a good Muslim and understand the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran, then you learn Arabic. Do we act more like Muslims than Christians when we resist or ignore complete and relevant translation and contextualization? I'm afraid we do. Some theologians and missionaries worry that contextualization is the slippery slope that leads to syncretism. They fear that contextualization will water down the gospel by diluting those aspects of the gospel that people in other cultures will perceive as offensive and therefore reject it. So we kind of water it down to remove the offense. Actually, it has the opposite effect. Contextualization is the best hedge against syncretism, not the slippery slope that leads to it. I've often said that the gospel is indeed offensive because it confronts our sinfulness and lays bare that we are broken, damaged human beings. But it is offensive in different ways to different people in different cultures. 
unfortunately, we, too have, we have too often offended people culturally by disdaining their culture and calling it primitive and pagan, or today we call it po hopelessly postmodern. So if we're going to be, offend people let's, who do not yet know Jesus, let's offend them for the right reasons. That is the offense of the gospel, and not the wrong reasons, which are too often the cultural preferences of the missionary and church worker. So rather than saying that contextualization is dangerous and leads to diminishing the power and claims of the gospel, good contextualization offends people for the right reasons, because it confronts people in their sinfulness and calls for repentance and transformation. Good contextualization sharpens the focus of the gospel. It doesn't blunt or diffuse it. Poor contextualization, or the complete lack of it, is more offensive, but for very different reasons. It can be offensive when the missionary or church worker insists that followers of Jesus in other cultures must adopt and embrace the cultural patterns of the missionary. This can be and often has been offensive to the people among whom the missionary is working. So if we're going to offend people, let's offend them for the right reasons, the offense of the gospel, and not the wrong reasons, our cultural lifestyle that can be offensive to them. Let us hear no more phrases like we heard in pre-communist China, one more Christian, one less Chinese. I remember several years ago, along with my colleagues from the Mission Society, uh, conducting a seminar in Kenya on the topic of crossing cultural barriers with the gospel. I began the conference with a public apology. I said to the, par to the participants, we're all grateful to God that American and British missionaries brought the gospel to Kenya. However, I want to apologize for the way in which many of my ancestors, and unfortunately some of my contemporaries, have brought the gospel to your ancestors. Many of them rubbish the culture of your ancestors and call it primitive and pagan, not realizing that God's prevenient grace had already been there and left a witness of God's presence. The message they sent to your ancestors was that if you want to become a Christian, you have to abandon your culture and embrace our Western culture, our systematic theology, and our church polity and organization. I asked them, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me and my ancestors for the way that we brought the gospel to Kenya and the way some of us are still doing it today? As I spoke, I noticed tears starting to stream down the cheeks of many of the 125 participants. God's spirit descended on us and we were greatly moved. That evening, word spread quickly throughout the area that this was not going to be another typical seminary, a seminar like so many others that come from America. It was going to be very different. The next morning, the number of participants had swelled to 186. At the end of a fabulous week, the African organizer of the conference stood up and said, what a mighty outpouring of God's spirit <clears throat> um, we had witnessed that, uh, that, that, uh, that week. <clears throat> And he asked for two volunteers to come to the front of the assembly hall and share what the week had meant to them. An old lady from the back of the room ran to the front because she did not want to miss this opportunity. She stood and said, you can see that I'm an old lady. I've lived a long time, but never in my lifetime until this week have I ever heard a white man apologize for anything until now. I want to say to you, you are forgiven, and the offense is over. I'm going home to tell my children what happened this week, and that we can once again affirm our culture and our identity as Kipsigis in Kenya and follow Jesus. The two do not need to be separated. The door to contextualization in her culture had been flung open, and she and her family were going to walk through it and discover how to be a Christian within her culture, not separated from it. You see, when the gospel is presented in word and deed, through proclamation and the way we live, and if the church is organized along relevant and appropriate patterns in the culture, then you have the birth of contextualization. The gospel will sink deeply into their worldview and transform their values, and people will more likely be confronted with the offense of the gospel instead of the cultural offense of foreign missionaries. It will expose their own sinfulness and the tendency toward creating evil, oppressive, 
social structures, and behavior patterns within their culture. And that is really good news. It could be argued that the genius of the Wesleyan revival in the 18th century, in 18th century England, was precisely because John and Charles Wesley, through their, through their preaching, their music, their social organization, and uh, they, what they did is they contextualized what it meant to be a follower of Jesus in English society that was undergoing rapid and significant social and economic changes. The official Church of England at the time had lost touch with the common people. And so when John Wesley was forbidden to preach in those churches, he went outside the church. And he preached to thousands in the open air and fields and declared, the world is my parish, not the local church, since the Church of England could not be. Mission historian Andrew Walls said it so clearly years ago in contrasting what he called the indigenizing principle or contextualization with what he called the pilgrim principle, which says our ultimate identity is found in the kingdom of God, not in our culture, nor our denomination, he notes. Along with the indigenizing principle, which makes his faith a place to feel at home, the Christian inherits the pilgrim principle, which whispers to him that he has no abiding city and warns him that to be faithful to Christ will put him out of step with his society. For that society never existed in East or West, ancient time or modern, which could absorb the word of Christ painlessly into its system. Jesus within Jewish culture, Paul within Hellenistic culture, take it for granted that there will be rubs and friction, not from the adoption of a new culture, but from the transformation of the mind toward that of Christ. This is the kind of transformation we want to see happening, deep, deep within us. Now, I want to now turn, to, turn our attention to the incarnation as a biblical model uh, for cross-cultural ministry and as the supreme example of contextualization. In the Incarnation, God became contextualized as a Jew, uh, contextualized as Jesus the Jew, who was shaped and conditioned by first century, colonial, Roman, occupied, Palestine, Palestine culture. His time, Roman occupied, colonial situation, Jewish culture. Now this meant that Jesus' mother tongue was Aramaic and spoken with a low prestige accent around Galilee, not the high prestige accent in, in uh, Jerusalem. He avoided eating pork and other foods prohibited by the Torah. He would have been taught the Ptolemaic view of the universe that believed the sun revolved around a flat earth. He also would not have known that some diseases are caused by germs because no one in Jesus' time knew that. It wouldn't be till 1865 that Louis Pasteur would discover the germ theory. In other words, Jesus was thoroughly shaped by his Jewish culture at that particular time and in that particular place. I like to think of Jesus as the first 200% man, 100% God and 100% Jewish. The creator of the universe was manifest through Jesus the Jew, raised by a Jewish mama and an artisan father. You may protest, of course Jesus knew about germs and that the earth circled the sun because he's God. I agree. He could have played the God card, but did he? Philippians 2, 6 to 8, gives us another perspective. Paul, writing to Church of Philippi, says, the attitude you must have is the one that Christ Jesus had. And when I think about this, I oftentimes want to say that the most important thing that we have for cross-cultural ministry is not training, not experience, not knowledge, not bank accounts, but the right attitude. And here is the attitude that we should have. It's the attitude that Christ Jesus had. Verse 6. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to become or remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, even his death on the cross. You see, the God who created the universe chose to enter into our world in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. He emptied himself of all the power, the position, the prestige of being God. And unlike most of us, he chose downward mobility 
not upward mobility. We know that the incarnation is an important theological doctrine of God becoming a human being. But perhaps more importantly, it is also a model for mission and contextualization. The, incarn the incarnation tells us something about God. God chose an imperfect culture at a certain point in time with all its defects and limitations to make known God's supreme revelation in Jesus. From the beginning of humanity, God has been reaching out to human beings embedded in their different cultures. And God's plan for salvation of the world has been to use ordinary human beings like you and me to reach those who are immersed in cultures that are different from our own. We are invited to join God's mission in the world. The many different cultures of the world are gifts of God's grace, not the enemy of the gospel. The enemy is the enemy, and let's not forget that. The enemy is the enemy, not culture. The incarnation tells us that God is not afraid of using diverse cultures, languages, and worldviews to communicate with us, and we shouldn't be afraid either. J.D. Gordon once said, Jesus, Jesus is God spelled out in language that human beings can understand. No one's ever seen God. No one's ever seen God. But we know a lot about God because of Jesus. So Jesus is God spelled out in language that human beings can understand. This language through which human beings can understand God is the language of culture. And they are vastly different from each other. The incarnation shows us that God has taken both humanity and culture seriously. So the incarnation tells us something about God's nature. It also becomes a model for ministry in our own time and place. In the same way that God entered Jewish culture in the person of Jesus, we must be willing to enter the culture of the people among whom we serve, to speak their language, to adjust our lifestyle to theirs, to understand their worldview and religious values, to laugh and to weep with them. When we do this, we become advocates for contextualization. When we are afraid or refuse to do this, we communicate that Christianity is a foreign religion, and consequently, it's often rejected as irrelevant. When it is accepted, its influence may be limited to changing some behavior on the surface of a culture, rather than penetrating the deepest levels of their worldview and bringing true transformation. Filipina Melba Magai, who's director of the Institute for Studies in Asian Church and Culture here in Manila says, through almost five centuries of Christian tradition, this country remains unengaged by the gospel where it matters most. In what anthropologists call the deep structures of culture, matters of conscience, conscience, worldview, and values. The renowned Asian theologian M.M. Thomas, in reflecting on why the Indian church is so westernized today and why Christianity continues to be perceived as a foreign religion in India, notes that Christianity was brought to India by Western missionaries in the colonial area as a potted plant. He says, but if they had brought us the gospel as a seed and enabled us to plant it deeply within the soil of India, it would have grown and flourished. But they didn't. They brought it as a potted plant. Good contextualization enables the church to grow organically in depth, but the lack of it stifles growth, and over time it degenerates in ju into just a nominal form of Christianity. As 2 Timothy 3, 5 describes, they will have the form of godliness, but reject its real power. It will be Christian in name only. This is the challenging problem we see throughout this region, but not only here. I've seen it everywhere I've gone in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you.